Okay. <laughs> Great. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everybody, uh, wherever you may be. Um, really delighted to uh, be part of this uh, legacy event. Um, uh, 10 years of uh, successful uh, efforts by many partners. Uh, we had a wonderful opening ceremony. Um, thanks so much to uh, Patrick and Dr. Shakuntla and, and others who spoke uh, and started us off. Um, we are um, ready to start the first panel of the day um, on agriculture and nutrition linkages. Um, and as I was preparing for this session, really, I was reflecting on sort of this unique uh, nutrition innovation lab, how unique it is. And to me, it's um, if there is one word really that uh, highlights that uh, uniqueness is integration. Um, you could hear already from the presentations, um, sort of integration across sectors in advancing knowledge, um, answering important questions around various elements of the food system, uh, from production to markets, uh, to consumption, uh, to various uh, steps along the, the value chain, um, questions around climate change uh, that we'll hear about a little bit in this session as well, um, uh, integrating uh, evidence from epidemiologic studies with biological mechanisms that uh, uh, Patrick Webb uh, shared, um, and really looking ultimately at impact on um, health, nutrition, and development in the context of children. Child development is a key element. So integration was really key. The second element is uh, integration across um, schools in the US and partners around the world. It's really an amazing network uh, of partners, friends, and colleagues um, at many institutions in the US, uh, in Africa, um, in Asia. Um, from Malawi to Tanzania, from Bangladesh to Nepal and, and far beyond, really providing a wonderful opportunity to learn uh, from each other. And I have personally learned a lot. And last, really, the integration of research and training that came up uh, as well a couple of times already uh, this morning, how critical it is to advance knowledge, but also to build capacity. And the two issues really uh, go hand in hand. I didn't realize that <clears throat> uh, the number 6,000 that uh, Dr. Shakuntla mentioned, um, who had uh, gained uh, tangible skills uh, through this ne network and uh, innovation lab. So clearly a lot of um, new uh, partners who have come on board and, and really delighted to see these as um, a key element of success. Uh, we are all grateful for uh, USAID and, and uh, other uh, partners who have made this possible. Um, so on to this session, um, really advancing in some detail um, some of the questions that uh, were highlighted very briefly uh, by Dr. Webb. And we have uh, four outstanding uh, panelists. I'll introduce them briefly, and then we will be able to uh, move right on to the presentations in the same order. Um, <clears throat> Andrew Thornlineman. Uh, Dr. Thornlineman is an associate scientist and nutrition epidemiologist. Uh, in the Center for Nutrition at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. His research explores links between food systems, diets, and nutrition, and health outcomes and development. Um, he also works on validation of indicators to measure the effectiveness of nutrition programs. Uh, Andrew has a doctoral degree in nutrition from Harvard, uh, a master's in health science from Johns Hopkins. Uh, we will next hear from um, Dr. Um, Gerald Shively. Um, Jerry is an applied economist with uh, 25 years of experience in teaching and research uh, on food security, on human nutrition, and agricultural sustainability. Uh, he currently serves as Associate Dean and Director of International Programs at um, the College of Agriculture at Purdue University. We will then hear from um, uh, Dr. Will Masters, who is a professor uh, in the Friedman School of Nutrition and the Department of Economics at Tufts University. He's a co-author of an undergraduate text textbook um, a titled Economics of Agricultural Development, World Food Systems and Resource Use, uh, and is an elected fellow of the Agricultural and Applied Economics Association. And last but not least, <clears throat> Delighted to have Dr. Isabel Mazzurera, who is a postdoctoral researcher 
uh, in the Department of Global Health and Population at the Harvard uh, T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, Isabel has uh, a doctorate degree in nutritional epidemiology from Harvard, a master's degree from Tufts, and a BSc uh, in nutrition from the University of Zimbabwe. Her interests are at the intersection of agriculture, nutrition, and sustainable diets. And she has really vast experience in the field, uh, uh, working previously with Save the Children, UNICEF, the World Bank, and the Ministry of Health of Zimbabwe. So, an exciting uh, series of presentations that we will follow up with uh, an open discussion. Uh, please do put your um, questions and comments uh, um, in the chat, and we will certainly be able to refer to them. With that, I will pass it over to Andrew to start us off. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Dr. Fauzi. Next slide, please. Thank you. So today I'm gonna to be sharing some work that we did within the Nutrition Innovation Lab on the seasonality of child diets and food systems. As all of you know, farmers rely extensively on seasonal patterns of rainfall and temperature to make important decisions about where to, when to plant, when to harvest and what to plant. And in most rural parts of the world, this also shapes the foods that are available in food systems, as well as people's ability to purchase food. Next slide, please. Similarly, many forms of malnutrition are seasonal. Take, for example, this data from Bangladesh on the prevalence of child wasting for seven consecutive years in the 1990s. You can see how dramatic the swings were from 10% at the bottom up to 20% in a given year. So even though seasonality is an ever-present dimension of rural agrarian life, many of the efforts that have been made to understand the links between agriculture and nutrition or to track indicators over time often rely on just one-time surveys or multi multiple year surveys without much thought as to what's happening in between those surveys or those years. Next slide, please. So in today's presentation, I'm gonna highlight some of the work that we did within the Nutrition Innovation Lab that relates to seasonality in the three papers that are shown here, two of which were led by my colleague, Elena Brodeshe, and one by myself. And all of these are available on the Nutrition Innovation Lab website. Next slide, please. Poor dietary quality in early childhood has been linked to impaired growth and development. And the majority of calories that are consumed by young children in most countries come from staple grains and increasingly highly processed foods. And so increasing household access and ch children's consumption of high quality, nutrient dense, non-staple foods is an important opportunity to improve dietary quality and potentially also nutrition and child development. Next slide, please. And here's a few examples of those types of foods that I'm talking about. Many of those foods, however, are highly seasonal in different contexts. Next slide, please. And so the data that I'm presenting today comes from the Poshan study in Nepal, which was a nutrition innovation lab funded activity with a goal of improving our understanding of the linkages between agriculture, food security, diets and nutritional status to help inform policies and programs. Next slide, please. The study consisted of four national surveys conducted between 2013 and 2016 in 21 sites throughout the country. Now, Nepal, as all of you know, is a country with substantial climatic and agricultural variation across the three different zones of the country. And so in deciding where to do this study, we thought it was important to sample from all three zones, the mountains, the hills, and the Terai, which are the plains of the country. Um, in three of those areas, which are shown with the blue hexagons there, we did a more in-depth investigation of, of the seasonality of different indicators, including those relating to diet, nutritional status, and other things to help uh, elucidate our understanding of seasonality. Next slide, please. So here you can see when the data collection occurred. And so the main surveys were conducted during the monsoon season. We also had in these seasonal sentinel sites, we had a uh, data collection during the post-monsoon harvest season. So that's a time that's where food is more abundant as well as the winter lean season. And this was two for two consecutive years. Next slide, please. And so in the first study, we wanted to examine 
the seasonality of different non-staple foods. And surprisingly, this has not been well studied in South Asia. In fact, a systematic review in 2018 showed that there was only one study which was identified, which they found looking at seasonality of children's diets in this region. Specifically, we wanted to ask, you know, given the heterogeneity of the climate and the agroecological zones, what seasonal patterns exist in the child consumption of these different foods? And does household wealth help to buffer the seasonal effects that we see? Next slide, please. And here's the foods we were interested in. And so pro-vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables, dairy, eggs, and meat. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So on the y-axis of these figures, it's the number of times that children ate each food or each category of foods within the last seven days. The red line represents the equivalent of daily consumption. So that's seven days in a week. Next slide, please. And then at the bottom, we have each of the three different seasons and each of the three different regions, the monsoon, sorry, the mountains, the hills, and the terai. And what we see, for example, for fruits and vegetables is that it, during the monsoon season, you see higher consumption uh, than the other two seasons. In the hills, there's very little seasonal variation. And in the terai, you see almost no consumption of fruits and vegetables by children during the post-monsoon harvest season, which, as I said, is often viewed as a time of plenty. Next slide, please. In contrast, dairy, you also see some seasonal patterns that are differ throughout the country. And so uh, in the mountains, you see during the winter season, you see lower uh, consumption of, of dairy by children. Um, in the hills, which is probably the main area where dairy is produced in the country, you see that it, during the monsoon season, which is recognized by dairy farmers as the time is the lean season, you see lower consumption by children. So that makes sense. Next slide, please. So disaggregating this, uh, what we see for fruit and vegetable consumption in the mountain region, we see disparities emerge, especially in the winter season. And, um, and we do see that wealth does appear to help buffer seasonal decreases in consumption. You can see this is divided by uh, wealth turtile and that the blue line represents the wealthiest households. It still doesn't completely prevent the seasonality, seasonal patterns in, this, in these foods, but it does to help buffer. Next slide, please. And so as far as the implications of this work, I think we need to start thinking more about this concept of round the year dietary quality for children. We know that this is a really important period for growth and development, which is happening rapidly. And the more we can ensure the continuity of dietary quality over the over the early childhood, the better. And that starts by understanding what these pa patterns look like. And so we need more work like this, looking at these seasonal patterns in different countries, as well as what potentially drives those patterns. Next slide, please. And so the second, moving on to the second paper, there's increasing evidence that animal source foods are very important for child growth and development. And you'll see other presentations today highlighting that. Um, and there's been many donor investments in small scale poultry and animal production, including Suhara 2 project in Nepal from USAID. And what we wanted to investigate was how strong is the association between ownership of livestock and poultry and the consumption of different types of animal source foods by children. Next slide, please. We were interested in three specific relationships. The ownership of cows and buffaloes in child dairy consumption, the ownership of chickens and child aid consumption, and the ownership of meat animals such as goats, chickens, rabbits, and child meat consumption. Now we were aiming to estimate the direct effects of livestock ownership on consumption. And so we adjusted for food purchases over the last 30 days of each of these foods to be able to isolate what is the, you know, what is the association between ownership and consumption. Next slide, please. And so what we see here is for dairy consumption, we see a linear increase between ownership of dairy of cattle and child consumption. And so on average, households need to own about two to four cattle in order for their children to consume on average dairy every day. Next slide, please. 
And so for egg consumption, and this is really interesting, we see that ownership of just one to two chickens or ducks is associated with an additional egg per day. But ownership of more poultry than that doesn't seem to be associated with greater consumption by the children in the household. Next slide, please. And for meat, we observed very little relationship, very weak association between the ownership of meat animals and child meat consumption. And perhaps that's because um, meat is consumed relatively infrequently. Next slide, please. Now for all three types of foods, we found a direct association between expenditure on that food at the household level in the last 30 days and consumption within the last week. Fairly strong associations there. Next slide, please. And so thinking about this, these findings provide empirical support for the types of programs that a lot of donors are investing in now around small scale animal production. They do suggest that especially for cattle, dairy, and for chickens, there is an association between ownership and child consumption. If we wanted to increase meat consumption to improve nutrition, that might require a stronger income generation component there because you probably would, that would be more likely to happen through purchases in markets. Next slide, please. On to the last slide. And so this one is a little bit different. For this paper, we, we, we were interested in studying a dietary diversity scale. Um, so child, the child minimum dietary diversity indicator is an important way that we use to measure child dietary quality in many countries and projects. And it basically consists of the sum of a number of different types of foods. Um, a problem that we have, even though it's collected through a lot of different systems, including the demographic and health survey, the mix, um, and used to track national product, pro progress towards child uh, nutrition, a problem is that sometimes these surveys take a long time to complete and sometimes they're not conducted in the same season. And so we were very interested in studying this question of could seasonality of this type of an indicator lead to incorrect conclusions if we're trying to measure, for example, five year progress at a national level of this indicator, if, if surveys are measured and are taken at different time points in the year, could that introduce the wrong conclusions? And we, we studied this using data, national continuous DHS data from Peru, Senegal, and our, our own survey in the Koshan study in Nepal. Next slide, please. And here you can see sort of the take home point. What we found was that in all three countries, it seemed that there were indeed small differences in this indicator about two to 4% different from the lean season to the non-lean season. And so we initially thought, well, this is quite small, but when you examine the relative importance of a two to 4% swing versus average annual changes um, of about 1% or even less one than 1% 1 per year, which were observed in both Peru and Senegal over many years, Really the take home point here is that if surveys are done in different seasons, we need to be quite worried about uh, the potential for incorrect conclusions to be reached. And that's even more true for rural areas and for projects in rural areas because that's where we saw much stronger seasonality. Next slide, please. And so I'd like to just thank everybody that was involved in the collection and the analysis, of this data on the Hopkins side from Tufts and our colleagues in Nepal. Um, and USAID and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for funding some of this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, over to you, Jerry. Great, can we launch the next, next slide? Happy to be here with everyone today. Um, I want to try to do two things in the, the short period of time that I have available. Uh, first, I wanna relate to the group um, uh, so what we've learned regarding the role of isolation and nutrition risk. Um, and that'll be the primary focus. But in order to do that, I also want to give some sense of how the research process uh, in uh, the research process has unfolded over time. And so there'll be a bit of a timeline as well to the, to the presentation. Um, and I wanna begin with an observation and a, and a question. Um, the, and the observation is that um, 
sorry, you're, uh, just hold on for a sec with the uh, advancing. Uh, the observation is that in, in most places where kids are economically, socially, or physically isolated, they're at much greater nutritional risk than their cohorts in less isolated settings. And that, that's not a new observation at all. Um, in Nepal, for example, uh, children below five living at, in remote locations have z-scores on average that are one to two units lower than, than children in less remote locations. And there are a lot of explanations that go along with that. Um, and some of the, the work that we've done has been an attempt to unpack that. Uh, and what I would say is that like a lot of successful research, uh, trying to answer one set of questions uh, often pulls back the curtain on, a, on another set of questions that are revealed. And so as we get to the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll try to hint at what some of those uh, new questions might be. Uh, I also wanna point out that this research um, is cataloged in a series of papers, about uh, a dozen that are listed at the end of the presentation. They're available on the, on the Innovation Lab website and they're all open access um, and linked, hyperlinked in the, the PowerPoint. So uh, let's let's click click forward and uh, back up to 2010. So go back in our time machine to the start of the Nutrition Innovation Lab project and what we were thinking at the time. And uh, my group had worked a lot with DHS data, observational data on child growth, and there was a paradox in the DHS data, namely that no matter you know how carefully one attempts to measure variation in z-scores among children, um, a lot of the variation is hidden or missing. And up to that time, I think the, the assumption was often that that's just measurement error or noise in the data. Uh, and so one of the things that we wanted to try to assess is whether that's actually true. Click. Uh, so one of, the, one of the challenges that we were facing at the time is that the DHS data, while rich in a lot of detail, is lacking in agricultural and environmental information. And because one of the mandates for the Nutrition Innovation Lab was to, to bring agriculture and nutrition together, we needed to find a way to combine data. Click, please. Actually, this turns out to be a very tricky data matching problem that presented a lot of conceptual and empirical challenges for us. Next. And back at the time, we approached this with a series of papers that established proof of concept for actually layering onto the DHS data, data from external sources, um, satellite remote sense data, data on yields from other surveys, data on rainfall, temperature, uh, even data on roads and bridges. And the diagram at the right is from a paper that we, we put together at about that time, where we were conceptually thinking about how we could look back in time uh, from uh, a child's environment or look into a child's environment, uh, looking backward from a time that the child was measured in the DHS survey to the, the agricultural or environmental conditions when that child was growing, uh, maybe even when that child was in utero. Next slide, please. So that led us up through sort of the midpoint in the, in the project to begin to put together a story that combined with what we knew about children, their mothers, their households, uh, information about the community and the larger environment. Uh, next. And so by merging data from these other sources, we were able to uncover some of the hidden variation in z-scores in features of communities, landscapes, and local environments. The, the chart to the right comes from a paper around this time where we were actually thinking about transportation linkages and roads and bridges as a kind of treatment that could be measured um, in conjunction with, with other things. And the story that clearly comes out of that effort is that isolation matters a lot. We were focusing primarily on children in Nepal and Uganda, 
Uh, but by, by looking at the kinds of environmental shocks or the kinds of environmental risks that children faced, we could begin to ask what kinds of mitigating factors uh, would minimize those risks. And uh, infrastructure emerged clearly as one of these mitigating forces, along with wealth, which Andrew mentioned. Um, we found, of course, that agricultural prices are buffered by roads and bridges, and that access to markets and services were key in mitigating some of the environmental and agricultural risks that children faced. Next. So as we entered sort of the, the end of the decade of research, a, a puzzle began to emerge. Uh, next, please. Looking at Nepal, we saw that even after you control for a broad set of child, household, and community factors, even environmental factors, child growth seems to be strongly associated and negatively associated with altitude in Nepal. And those who know Nepal know that the mountains are highly isolated areas. Uh, but isolation alone, uh, next click, um, doesn't seem to be the only thing driving the pattern. In other words, if we look at wealth and access to markets, to a large extent, they, they mitigate this, but not completely. Next click. And so we began to wonder, you know, is this pattern unique to Nepal? Next click. And what actually might altitude be telling us about the nutritional risks that children face in Nepal. And so coming into the last few years of the project, next click, we've generated new results with a somewhat broader picture and perhaps opening up new avenues for research. So we recently published results for 47 countries, more than 600,000 uh, children below age five. And the findings, click, clearly indicate uh, next click, please. That there is this pernicious effect of elevation that seems to persist, not just in Nepal, but, but across a broad set of countries. Um, but it may not just be isolation, next. So we're left with three hypotheses. One is that something about altitude may impair growth through hypoxia. Uh, there is some evidence from animal studies and even some human studies to, to suggest that that could be the case. Uh, another potential hypothesis is that altitude is in some way related to health or disease, and in particular, indoor air quality, where people are exposed to smoke from wood, wood fires or wood stoves. Um, and then the third hypothesis is that there's something that may be characteristic of soils at altitude, that may be driving the pattern. And in fact, because we find this, not just at extreme altitudes, but even at moderate altitudes, the soils hypothesis is particularly intriguing. Next click. And so if one begins to think about iron, zinc, selenium, and iodine deficiencies as existing in upland soils, that could translate into deficiencies, especially where diets are locally sourced. And when we observe that things like markets or wealth uh, are beneficial or mitigating, it may be that those individuals who are purchasing their food or, or um, entering markets may be importing some of these essential elements from other areas, lowland areas. And so those who can afford to purchase staples may be benefiting uh, nutritionally. And so that leaves, I think, open an avenue for exploration, uh, next click, where we might be able to think about research that focuses on testing different kinds of foods, tagging those foods, tracing them from production areas to consumption areas, and linking uh, the, the source of foods to consumer uh, patterns and nutrition outcomes. So leave that for you as a as a, a teaser as you know a, a possible uh, research avenue forward 
And again, final slide is just a series of papers um, that you can follow up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. Um, on to uh, the last two presentations who I know are always trying to keep to time. So thank you so much, Will, and followed by Isabel. And uh, for those of you who do have comments or questions, pl please do uh, share these as well. Will. Absolutely, yes. So uh, for this amazing event, I can follow directly on uh, Jerry Shively's points about isolation and bring in Andrew's uh, results from the Poshan survey. Um, and this will lead very well also to Isabel Mazzarera's uh, focus on, the, on diet quality coming up after this. But right now, just to think about what those seasonal and interannual climate shocks have revealed about linear growth, about child growth measured by heights, uh, guiding when and how to intervene. So just to foreshadow the answers here that we found so far regarding when, our clear conclusion is as early as possible, uh, but no sooner. So some of what we'll find is intrauterine and relates to uh, pre-pregnancy and maternal health. And some of it is early infancy, particularly the first half of the thousand days. So really as early as possible, the first half of the thousand days. And then regarding how, what we're doing is distinguishing between these systemic uh, uh, market issues or, or, or structural issues, the governance issues that Patrick Webb will talk about later um, from the uh, targeted interventions that allow us to identify specific food groups that I'll be flagging in a moment. So the next slide sets us up with, the next slide please, sets us up with the setting we began with at the start of the Nutrition Innovation Lab. So what you see here is the first year of the Innovation Lab with climatic variation across Nepal. We used this in with one of our first uh, doctoral trainees, Prajla Mumi, back in Nepal now, working on a range of uh, nutrition issues uh, with the government of Nepal and the World Bank. And clearly climate and these seasonal as well as annual fluctuations affect all aspects of family life and child growth. So we're trying to tease those out. And the next bullet says how we are trying to capture from the wide range of data that Andrew talked about from the Poshan story. But when we started the innovation lab before that, the next bullet shows what we were able to get from the DHS studies uh, like the ones that Jerry Shively described with his timeline of looking at data. So working with him uh, and with Prajla Momi and another colleague, um, we were able to identify the protective effects of certain kinds of public investments. So next bullet uh, shows the, the basic findings, which is that thinking about the linear height of children as measured in these demographic and health surveys at uh, dots that would be all across the red and green map that you see fluctuating seasonally, tying the exact month of recorded birth of each child. Um, what we see is that the climate shocks in pregnancy for boys were more significant uh, correlate of future height uh, and early infancy for girls. And that's actually consistent with a bunch of mechanistic work that's been done uh, in other settings with much smaller data sets. So we're finding at the population scale, some of the mechanistic understanding of intrauterine growth and vulnerability um, that has sex specificity regarding uh, the hormonal differences between pregnancies for boys and girls. Then there's remarkable associations with the outcome. So getting right at the isolation point that, um, that Jerry made for food markets, um, but also linking back to wash and other issues regarding sanitation um, that are both separately independently protective in these data. So the next slide, moves to the, what we were able to find with the Poshan data that Andrew described, where we're able to isolate some of the differences across types of households. Because of the richness of the Poshan data that Andrew introduced, we found that a household's own agriculture really matters for diet diversity only in the poorer households. Uh, they're not the ones buying from markets, the next bullet. Uh, also only for older children, they're the ones who are consuming the overall family diet, the next bullet. Um, over uh, particularly for the foods that are less easily purchased. So own production matters more. And that gets right to these points about isolation uh, that Jerry was talking about. The next slide takes us over to uh, the sort of end later stages of the Nutrition Innovation Lab research agenda where we were able to identify these new measures of resilience, thinking about prevention, how to what, what is it about households that we can um, measure that captures whether they're able to bounce back after adversity and have existing um, mechanisms to protect them um, and, and bounce back after 
adverse thing. What we found here is that the seven day dietary recall over the, the longer period of a week was actually, it, households were able to bounce back more. And the next bullet then identifies which kinds of households were able to have that recovery, uh, that resilience. Um, and it really involves those market connections that Jerry Shively just, just talked about, where isolation is really harmful for resilience. Um, and so anything that can be done to connect people uh, is, is much, it's very helpful. Next slide takes us to uh, the Africa component of the Innovation Lab, where in this case, we were building on the extraordinary work of the Innovation Lab to uh, build Malawi's first ever country specific uh, food composition table that could track food groups back to nutrients uh, needed for health. So in this case, I'm showing you data on a representative adult woman. We also do this work for uh, infants, children, um, and throughout the life course. But here for a representative adult woman, what you see is Andrew's points about seasonality combined with year to year changes in the Malawi context mapped through markets to the cost of each nutrient needed for healthy, uh, healthy uh, overall diet by food group. So from starchy staples at the bottom up to oils and fats uh, for macronutrient balance at the top, and what you see is every one of these food groups contributes separately to the vulnerability of the household and, and their ability to acquire healthy diet. So there's both seasonality layered in with interannual shocks. And the next slide maps that over to food groups. Where do these nutrients come from? They come from foods. These foods are grown in agro ecosystems that are specific. So in a kind of scientific hierarchy sense, this was our biggest discovery uh, in terms of publishing, you know, to reach a really general science audience about ecosystem functioning. In this paper in Science Advances, where we're able to show that the ecosystem and market linked functions of people in markets trying to use transport and storage to stabilize the hugely variable natural world uh, was differently successful in different food groups, uh, getting at Andrew's point about the different types of foods. So this is you know, in Malawi, a country that is um, um, sort of in some sense more similar geographically than, than Nepal is, the different regions. Um, looking across the entire country, what you see is in the next bullet, how the animal sourced and packaged foods, so the animal sources are in the middle, the packaged foods, oils and fats um, are at the bottom. They have no red, they are not seasonal. Then the next bullet shows you that the cereals and legumes the cereals are at the very top. They have a little bit of faint red towards the beginning of the year. I don't know if you can see that, but it's January, February, March is the period of the light red and the pink. And the legumes uh, just below that similarly. But then the next bullet shows you the fruits and vegetables down in the lower part of this chart, where you see the bright red peak of the intense high seasonal price, where that peak happens at different times of year. So when we think about timing of interventions, we're beginning to get quite granular guidance about when things need to happen. And the next bullet uh, really sort of makes the point about trying to identify context specific market, uh, market specific uh, interventions that could uh, stabilize access to nutrients through the food groups uh, that carry them. So the next slide gives us a, a different perspective on this looking demographically within the household. And here, a remarkable result from a doctoral student called Kate Schneider working with Patrick Webb uh, and a colleague at the World Bank, where we were able to identify the granularity within each household of the nutrient requirements of each member, young, old, male, female, uh, and, and lactating uh, during periods of lactation when calorie needs are very, very high. And what we find is that because there's this internal diversity within the household, one child, an elderly person, and you know, two adults, something like that. The top line is the monthly cost of meeting the nutrient needs for every individual with a single diet for everyone. And if you need to choose a movie that everyone likes or a meal at a rest, you know, the restaurant that everyone likes, you see how hard it is to find one thing that meets everyone's needs. It's much more expensive to do that. Um, and so the next bullet itemizes these, these results given the fact that in each location, in each month, people are switching back and forth between the fruits and vegetables and so forth that are seasonally available. The next bullet says, we really need to understand this granular uh, 
heterogeneity within the household and the difficulty of meeting each, uh, each person's needs, especially when you're trying to do it with a shared diet. So the next bullet just puts the bottom line that we, we, we need this granularity with respect to demographic targeting, um, which the Innovation Lab has been able to, uh, to, to find some quite strong evidence regarding the, the importance of that. And the next slide um, just emphasizes the magnitude of the uh, challenge ahead. So next bullet shows you that we have here a um, vastly richer data environment than when we began the innovation lab. So much, much more uh, primary observations and vastly more computing power guided by much richer scientific understanding of the mechanisms. So the, the answer in terms of what we've learned is intervene early, but not too early. Um, and in particular, just to get a sense of the magnitude of how much the challenge is, how big the challenge is, this chart just shows you the DHS data on the average number of food groups by, uh, by month of, uh, of a child's age as they go from six months introducing uh, uh, complementary foods uh, up to 24 months or so when they're at the family diet and no further increase in the different uh, types of foods consumed by an infant. And what you see is that even the richest tercile, the richest third of households in the DHS survey population uh, in low and middle income countries, they are so far from the minimum number of food groups. So the task of getting diverse foods into complementary food feeding for infants is a huge challenge. And the next bullet uh, gives us a, a, a sort of sense of the variety of interventions. Some of them are markets, international trade, access to varied and therefore more stable sources of all these different um, types of foods uh, and getting them into, into households targeted demographically as early as possible in the child's life. Next slide. So, um, so we're trying to target key foods uh, in, in, a, in a timely and location specific way. And the next slide, please. So in conclusion, we get a very rich picture of an enormously complicated world where we're using different kinds of data in the case, the original map I showed you at the beginning was vegetative growth, just the greening of the, of the surface of the earth. Um, we are doing interesting, very interesting new work on heat waves, on thermal stress, combining humidity with heat. Uh, very, very important to think about climate in a, in a more uh, uh, specific way. Next slide, please. Next bullet, please. And tracking that to outcomes um, is really helping us to, to understand when and where uh, to intervene not only for the extremes, but also at normal times. It's very important to remember that even a child above a z-score of minus two, that is one would not be counted as stunted, may still be uh, quite significantly malnourished in terms of their overall lifelong health. Next bullet, please. So we have a bunch of lessons. Next bullet gives us a sense that, um, first of all, diversifying sources is really crucial. If you're reliant on your own plot, you are among the poorest people in the world. If you're reliant just on your own village, you're still among the poorest. If you are able to draw on the entire world's biodiversity through global crop breeding and so forth, uh, then you become among those who have the privilege of stable year round access um, at higher levels of, of diet diversity that Isabel will talk about. Next bullet. Um, that sanitation and health services are very location specific. So unless you have uh, in our first study, uh, toilet within your yourself and your neighbors, um, that was what was needed for uh, sanitation. Next bullet, please. And what we're having is this uh, greater specificity of, uh, of, of result um, pointing to earlier interventions, some of which are systemic, some of which are uh, highly targeted. So the next slide um, just gives us a sense of the, the, the different kinds of collaborations that the innovation labs work uh, drew on for this particular set of results. And, uh, and that will lead, I think, very well to Isabel's um, work on diet quality. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Isabel, over to you. And we will hopefully have some time for uh, questions. So thank you so much for uh, the next presentation. Great, thank you so much, Ofai, uh, and thanks so much, Will. Uh, so today I will be discussing uh, the measurement of women's diet quality, also the role of food systems in uh, women's diet quality, as well as implications of maternal diet quality for child health outcomes. Next slide, please. 
When we started this work about six years ago, this was the status of the field. Most of the studies that were looking at diet, uh, diet quality were looking at the minimum diet diversity index for women as a measure of overall diet quality for women. This indicator is based on 10 food groups um, and has been uh, used quite extensively because it's easy to use. The MTDW is correlated with micronutrient adequacy. And uh, this was quite the right tool to use at the time because we are mostly concerned with monotonous diets for women, as well as for other members of the household. We are also uh, quite concerned about uh, seasonal availability of fruits and vegetables and limitations that other colleagues have mentioned about. So in, in essence, all our work around diet was really uh, trying to improve dietary uh, diversity. However, with the passage of time, we have realized that this uh, MDDW as an indicator for overall diet quality might have several limitations. One of the gaps is that it might not be able to capture global dietary transition, uh, particularly the increase in consumption of unhealthy foods in many low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. So when we started to think about alternative ways of measuring diet quality for women, especially in low and middle income countries, we realized that there were several limitations. The first one was that we did not find a globally accepted measure of overall diet quality for women that was being used. We know that there were several uh, indices that were used in studies here in uh, developed countries. For example, indices such as the um, Alternative Healthy Eating Index um, and several other indices that had been developed primarily for women and populations in developed nations. Now, these indices had not been validated in low and middle income countries. Therefore, that was a, a very big gap. In addition, we wanted to go beyond um, a dietary diversity for several reasons. One of the key definitions that has been proposed for overall diet quality is that it should not only address issues of diversity of diets, which are important for nutrient adequacy, but also overall diet quality should also consider moderation, particularly when we think about those micronutrients, sorry, about those foods and food groups that we know are associated with increased risk of poor disease outcomes. So we know that uh, saturated fat, sodium and sugar should be limited for someone to have an optimal diet. So in essence, uh, a measure of diet quality should have a way of assessing this and tracking this as changes over time in populations. In addition, a good measure of diet quality should also consider the balancing of uh, different energy uh, providing macronutrients, uh, carbohydrate, fats, and proteins in, in terms of how do they then optimize our overall diet quality. Next slide, please. So as, a, as part of our thought process or the working towards an answer in terms of how a diet quality could be measured for women um, in low and middle income countries, we embarked on what we thought was one of the first studies that was able to, com uh, to compare overall dietary diversity with the overall diet quality in relation to poor birth outcomes. And this was based on data that had been collected in Tanzania. So we had data from a study that had been collected in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and the data, um, the study had collected data from more than 8,000 pregnant women during pregnancy. And in, during pregnancy, repeated 24 hour dietary calls had been collected for women. And so this was quite a rich uh, data source. This work was recently published about a year ago uh, in, in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Uh, next slide, please. So when we thought about alternative measures of diet quality, we decided to try out the prime diet quality score. Now the prime diet quality score is an index that assesses both consumption of healthy foods and food groups, such as different forms of fruits and vegetables, uh, fish and poultry but also uh, measures consumption of unhealthy food groups. With unhealthy food groups, for example, we considered refined grains, uh, red meats, and sugar-sweetened beverages as unhealthy foods because we know that at higher consumption, they have been linked with increased risk of poor disease outcomes, or poor health outcomes, sorry. In studies that have been conducted in high-income contexts, we know that the PDQS has been shown to be protective against cardiovascular disease, against gestational diabetes and hypertension as well. And so we were quite excited to try out this indicator. Next slide, please. 
In terms of overall diet quality in this population in urban Tanzania, we found that there was increasing um, consumption of unhealthy foods with four or more servings per week uh, consumption for some key food groups, such as refined grains. We found that at least 22% of the women had four or more servings of red meat in one week. So we thought this was a bit on the higher end and higher than what we had anticipated uh, for this study population. And then when we looked at consumption of healthy food groups, we found just like others have reported that there were limitations in availability and consumption of some of the healthy food groups, such as nuts, citrus fruits and eggs. In terms of overall associations with birth outcomes, for our measure of diet quality, the PDQS, we found that the PDQS was associated uh, with a lower risk of preterm births, low birth weight and fetal loss among mothers. In addition, when we looked at the performance of the MDDW, our measure of dietary diversity, we found that it was associated with less risk of gestational, small for gestational age births. Um, so in essence, in this study, we found that the PDQS had, had performed better uh, than the MDDW in linking with poor pregnancy outcomes. In terms of implications for child health, we think that this finding suggests that both maternal dietary diversity and quality may be modifiable risk factors for adverse birth outcomes in Tanzanian mothers. In addition, because of these findings, we wonder whether it is time to think beyond dietary diversity when we think about prenatal and nutrition counseling for mothers to also consider how the increase in consumption of unhealthy foods could impact not only birth outcomes, but also nutrition and health outcomes for mothers as well. But in essence, this doesn't mean that we think that we should throw away uh, the MDDW or diet diversity. In another study that we had also conducted in a birth cohort in Uganda, we found that women that had diversified diets during pregnancy were less likely to have underweight infants. Therefore, we believe that there's still room for both diet quality and diet diversity in the future. Next slide, please. We then wanted to find out, still in the context of Tanzania, whether it was important for us to measure diet quality in a rural context. We wanted to also understand what was the role of food systems in determining overall diet quality. And for this question, we used uh, the HANU study, which had collected data from about 880 women. This intervention had, had been designed as a homestead food production intervention that had, promoted, that had promoted vegetable production as well as behavior change communication. And this had been implemented in Rufiji Road District. Next slide, please. When we looked at overall nutritional status for women in this study, we found that uh, for women in rural Tanzania, overweight was quite high with about 24% of the women affected while obesity affected about 13% of the women. This was compared with underweight that affected only 7% of the women. This was quite surprising for us that there was coexistence of both over and under nutrition in this population. When we looked at overall diet quality, we found that the PDQS was quite poor in this location and that consumption of healthy food groups such as eggs, poultry, and nuts was also low in this population. And then when we looked at consumption of unhealthy foods by rural women in Tanzania, the figure on the right gives us a clearer picture. We, so the green color indicates consuming four or more servings per week of a particular food group. The red color indicates consuming two to three servings per week and the blue indicates consuming one serving or none per week. As you can see for refined grains, potatoes, and to some extent desserts and ice cream, consumption of these unhealthy foods was higher than what we had anticipated with the majority of women uh, consuming higher uh, levels than we uh, thought were optimal. Next slide, please. When we looked at overall uh, associations between uh, food crop diversity, for example, um, and uh, diet quality, this is what we found. We found that uh, when households produced more food groups, this was associated with higher diet quality for women. However, this association was mediated by proximity to markets, meaning that for those households or women that lived closer to markets, food crop diversity had a stronger association with diet quality. And then when we looked at the association between distance to market, and women's diet quality, we found a negative association, meaning that overall, those women that live further away from markets 
we're likely to have uh, lower diet quality. And finally, when we looked at the role of women's empowerment, we found that when women had um, uh, access to employment, this was associated with higher diet quality. Next slide, please. Just in conclusion, so although we've learned quite a bit in the, in the last few years, we still think that there are gaps, particularly when it comes to the measurement of diet quality. We think it's still important to increasingly measure consumption of unhealthy food groups by women and children. We also think that the validation of measures of diet quality is important, especially looking at associations with disease outcomes. We also think that there is room to further explore how food systems influence overall diet quality in both rural and urban settings. And finally, we think that when we are designing programs to improve diet quality or diversity, we need to consider access to markets as well as women's access to all farm income. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. I would like to acknowledge our participants and partners from Harvard uh, and uh, the sites in Tanzania, as well as from the Nutrition Innovation Lab. Next slide, please. And also just sharing some of the key papers um, that inform this presentation. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to a fine. Thank Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Isabel, and thanks to uh, all the prior present, uh, presenters. Um, we have some time for questions. Um, clearly, we would have benefited from a lot more time presenting um, because there are really rich findings in each, uh, each person who couldn't uh, elaborate on, but hopefully we can touch on some of these uh, in this Q&A. Um, uh, I'll start with a question uh, for Andrew um, that came uh, in the chat from Ahmed Kablan, uh, who uh, incidentally is, uh, has been instrumental to the Nutrition Innovation Lab, and we're really grateful uh, for your support, Ahmed. Um, question for you, Andrew, is about food storage, particularly around meat consumption. Um, so uh, Ahmed asks, do you think meat consumption as it is associated with animal ownership may go up if there was household level cold storage or refrigeration available. And he reflects on his own experience growing up in Jordan uh, with this challenge. So over to you, Andrew, what do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think in Nepal, probably um, consumption of meat, like slaughtering an animal, you know, is, is a relatively infrequent event. Right, and it, oftentimes it might be done around certain festivals, et cetera. Right, and so I think that's probably the main driver here is that you know people own livestock or chickens for other reasons. Um, you know, and so I think that's probably the main determinant. I think if if cold storage were available, sure, instead of having to consume it the same day, then you know you the household would have the ability to spread out that consumption over several days or more. So probably, but. Um, but I do think the main issue is how many, how much livestock do people own and how infrequently do they um, slaughter? Great, thank you so much. Um, moving on to Jerry, um, you touched on many points, uh, Jerry. So uh, really I'll focus on one aspect that you started off with, and that is sort of the richness of data that's out there from DHS to uh, data on the environment to uh, data from the World Bank uh, uh, Living Standards Measurement Survey and the importance of integrating these to answer questions and thinking about the future really uh, for, for, for um, additional work. Could you comment a little bit from your experience about capacity to use that data, uh, access to the data sets and what training might be it's really important to invest in to make um, more and better use of these uh, rich data sets? Yeah, that's a really great question and observation. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to remember what, what we were working with prior to 2010. And there was really kind of an explosion at the time of, of data made available. And a lot of a lot of attempts on the part of researchers to integrate these data and to think about how they could be properly matched and merged, um, what proper units of analysis ought to be. And I think with that work in its infancy, there were a lot of missteps and a lot of things learned. And 
to some extent, we're still learning about integrating data. Um, and so it, it, I think, really points to um, the need for nutrition researchers to think very broadly about um, the tools at their disposal, the data at their disposal, the collaborations that they want to form. Uh, the decade ahead will probably bring online an even larger amount of data than we've seen in the past decade as we begin to collect information from cell phones, as we get more individualized data. Uh, being able to manage that data uh, will require new skills. And a lot of those skills may be outside the, the traditional domain of nu nutrition research. Um, in, in fields of data analysis and, and um, the like. So I think it's a really exciting time, especially for young researchers to you know, expand the boundaries of what, what we consider nutrition research and the kinds of tools that are available. Uh, but I'm sure that my observations aren't the only ones. I'm sure Andrew or, or Will or others would like to weigh in on that as well. Um, thanks so much, Jerry. And maybe, uh, um, Will, you could comment on that as well. Um, clearly, uh, in this era of data science, um, we need to integrate uh, these rich sources. Um, we have already sort of started working together from epidemiologists to economists, and that's a, an, an advance uh, already. Uh, would you have uh, thoughts about sort of this next phase and how to harness this data better? Yeah, what I mean, other I would just... Go ahead. It's a great theme, great question. And I would just add one more aspect of it, which is the complementarity between the hyper-specialized world of research at um, you know, the very biggest universities where people are most connected. And so individuals can really specialize in something uh, you know, over the course of a career. And then complementarity between that and the more applied researchers, and then ultimately the uh, the, 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 the field context, the country specific rich um, pre-search or formative research or context dependent knowledge. So unless you merge those groups, as I think we have done in the innovation lab, you can't have that full cycle from the hyper-specialized um, you know, lifelong data analyst who really understands satellite imagery and so forth um, to the field context. So I think the key thing is to really connect the universities in the US um, with, or Europe or elsewhere, um, with the you know, more specialized people, with the more applied people, with the policy engaged, and, uh, and ultimately really listen very, very carefully to research subjects. So at the end of the day, we have qualitative components of surveys. We have uh, even focus group interviews in, uh, in qualitative research methods. So we tie the big data to the ground truth. Yeah, and, and bring in other disciplines and other fields that, uh, as Jerry said, typically are not sort of uh, groups that we work with closely. Uh, computer scientists, uh, um, heavy uh, quantitative sciences and biostatistics that sort of enable uh, these data to be integrated and, and used. And many um, sort of nutrition scientists can bring in a lot of insights and, and uh, sort of thinking about um, sort of the appropriate questions and, and the optimal interpretation of these findings. So really it's a team effort that's exciting to see hopefully grow uh, in the next few years. Um, uh, let's continue with Isabel and then come back to you, Andrew, to comment on this as well, if you have any uh, insights. Isabel, you talked about, um, well, one, if you have any uh, observations about this, uh, but you called for collecting even more data and uh, noted that we need to think broader than um, dietary diversity. There is MDBW, there is dietary diversity um, uh, scores and systems also for assessment of diet among children. Could you comment a little bit on where do we go from here as far as additional data that we need to collect or tools that we need to validate to assess diet quality uh, among uh, sort of populations across the life cycle? Great, that's a really good question, Wafai. Um, I think this is a very, <laughs> very important topic, but really hard to get a grasp on. There are many different researchers 
which is encouraging, that have started to work on the issues of diet quality in different spheres with different indices that are being tested. So I know that uh, there's currently efforts by different groups to advance different measures of diet quality. For example, I know that uh, one of the research groups at Harvard has also looked at the global uh, diet quality index, the GDQS, uh, which is one of which is an uh, update or improvement on the PDQS that I used in my analysis. So in terms of sort of the way forward or forward thinking on this, I think there's greater need to validate such tools that have come up in the last few years to see whether they do link up or can predict poor health outcomes. Ultimately, we're concerned about trying to change nutrition and health outcomes. So we need to see how the different indices that, we're, that are proposed and being used across the globe can be informative as far as showing linkages with poor nutrition and health outcomes. In addition, we know that uh, the work that we did primarily in our research group has focused a lot on women, but there are also other groups that have not been really, other groups such as children and adolescents where measures of overall diet quality are lagging. We are not sure whether it's possible to measure overall diet quality in children or in adolescents. We are not sure what are the tools that are available to be able to do this. So there's definitely need for more data gathering, not only for women, but also for other different groups to be able to track not only dietary transition and nutrition transition, but also to see how the impact of uh, unhealthy diets on, on health and nutrition outcomes is evolving ac across the globe. So I think those are, uh, key issues that we need to advance. Um, I think finally, there's need to also move towards simplification. So a lot of the tools that we've been talking about in diet quality, uh, yes, they are more simplified than what we started with, but still the need for simplicity, it's important to be able to test this out in, in uh, applied research in many different contexts. So moving from our bigger tools to more simplified measures of diet quality, I think would be beneficial for the field. I'll stop there. Great, thank, thank, you. thank you so much, uh, Isabel. Um, uh, we are going to run out of time as we always do when it's such an exciting um, panel and, and sort of lots to share. Uh, perhaps if I could ask every one of the four panelists to speak for sort of very briefly, one bullet point, um, the food system is complex. There are many issues. We talked about isolation and many factors that need to be borne in mind. And at the end of the day, it's ultimately relevant um, with respect to interventions. Um, how do we use these findings in the field to make a meaningful impact on the nutrition and health of individuals? So if everyone could just speak sort of to one intervention. <laughs> it's hard because it's a complex system across sectors, but starting with you, Andrew, and then moving down the line, that would be helpful. Uh, this is tough. Um, this is really tough. I, I think perhaps food processing is important. Um, you know, I, I'm just thinking about, um, thinking about young children and the difficulty that we have in getting some of these nutrient dense foods into them. Um, things like eggs are relatively simple because you can mush them up, but things like fish, um, things like meat, uh, it takes time to process. It takes a lot of time. Uh, and so I think food processing has a role um, in trying to get some of these foods into children. Excellent, so thank you. Andrew, it's not the only one. I'm sure you had a lot more. But uh, thank you for uh, trying. Next. Uh, so I think that as an economist, uh, I'm guilty of always looking at markets as a potential solution. And obviously, markets have a very important role to play. And providing better access to markets uh, is important. But I think it's also essential to remember that even where markets are available, not everyone can equally access those markets. And even when foods are available for purchase, not everyone can purchase those foods. And so uh, market access has to be conjoined with uh, income generation schemes that, that raise the incomes of the poor so that they can access foods that are in, in markets. And uh, ideally with interventions that help bring down prices in those markets, to make those foods more available 
or more affordable rather. Um, and that, that means, you know, investments in infrastructure as well. Thank you so much, Jerry. Will? Great, yeah, and just to bridge from Andrew to what Jerry just said, you know, to go with interventions that target governance, that recognize the importance of the indicators that Patrick Webb will talk about, where we're understanding what about the government needs to change here, because we're discovering that the food system, it's not your grandfather's food system anymore, it's a food system that requires targeted government intervention, that means um, investments in public systems uh, for uh, public service and public good delivery. Thank you, Isabel. Great, that's, an, that's a great question. And I, I leverage on my field experience for this answer. I, I think that what I observed for the most part is that we speak a lot about increasing consumption of fruits and vegetables. However, the value chains for these are not very well established in many low and middle income countries. So establishing not only value chains for marketing and selling, that gives an incentive for farmers to produce this, but also uh, when we think about seeds and seed systems to support production of legumes, even of small livestock, I feel like the technology is lagging behind with most governments really focusing on cereal grains and supporting value chains around cereals and any of the cash crops. So I think that these often food crops need to have fully developed uh, value chains so that people can be interested in growing them, but also just we need to improve productivity um, for the different fruits and vegetables that are nutritious so that people can access them better. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, Isabel. And thanks everybody, as was evident really from this last segment. It's a complex system, um, the food system with various uh, elements, various points of uh, uh, sort of affecting it, ultimately to have an impact on nutrition and health. And that's what's exciting about this innovation lab really. It brings together these various perspectives, disciplines, um, uh, colleagues uh, from everywhere to, to advance knowledge and, and have an impact at the end. Um, we have run out of time. I wish we had more time, but there is a lot more exciting panels coming up. Thank you so much again, uh, Andrew, Jerry, Will, and Isabel. Take care.